Today, if you've got your Bibles there, turn to Romans 12. We're going to stay in Romans 12 today, and I hope it's encouraging and empowering. Um, we've, I personally have spent quite a bit of time in Romans 12. As you can see from the text on the Bible there, there's a bit of colouring in texture when you look at the scriptures and you wrestle with it. And I remember somebody made a very profound comment. When the Lord decided to, to the time had come to have that final meal with his disciples, he organised an upper room, I've eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer, and then he instituted the symbols of the new covenant, the bread, the fruit of the wine, accompanied by foot washing. And he did that in community. And he did it with a level of I in you and you in me that Peter didn't understand when Jesus came around to wash his feet. He said, Lord, you wash my feet? You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't have do this to you, you have no part in me. In other words, there's certain things that are experienced in community. Today I want to welcome our brothers and sisters logging in on live streaming because they live at a geographical disadvantage, whether it's Geraldton or Esperance or Junee or, or many other places, um, and, and those places that don't have regular worship. And so we recognise the value of coming together. Now, one of the challenges that we face is that we have this notion in our hearts to be a part of authentic Christianity, so I'm going to find an authentic church, that I, a, a church where there's no, no aberration from Scripture. But in reality, when you study the seven churches in the book of Revelation, you can see that they're on a journey. They had different characteristics, different doctrines, different it, maladies, and Jesus gives them a report card and encourages them in one hand with a mercy, and in the justice, on the other hand, tells them, you've got to change. You can't stay a dead church. You can't stay pitiful, poor, blind and naked. You can't stay worshipping the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. You can't have the Jezebel spirit in your church or whatever Jesus was correcting. But the church exists in community. We are called together as into family. And I love my blood family, but I love my family in Christ. It brings us together as brothers and sisters. And one of the things that I love about the Church of God's Seventh Day is that we refer to each other as brother or sister. And that fits in with Jesus' teaching where he says, you know, those who have forsaken all, Jesus will give mother and father and brother and sister many times over. And we experience that in community. And when Paul wrote his letter, he wrote to the church in Rome and he addresses the subject of what does it look like to live in community? What are some of the things and the challenges that we'll face living in community? And how do we bring the best of what Christ is in us to love one another and to love sacrificially? You know, when Jesus says, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, a cup of cold water to the thirsty, food for the hungry, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a sojourner, I was a visitor, and you welcomed me. He says, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, he said, you have done it to me. And what Jesus is talking about is community and how it's lived in community and how we actually are known as a people who really love one another. I mean sacrificial love, committed love, dedicated love. We live in a world... Where, the, where we can easily smorgasbord. What I mean by smorgasbord, we can be a part of this fellowship one week and part of another fellowship next week, and the capacity to truly sacrifice your personal sovereignty, to bring your gifts. All of us are gifted. And what we have, we are stewards for. It's been given to us. Sister Arely and Raquel sang for us just then. Joshua did a children's message. Leah did a scripture reading. And all of us affirmed it because it spoke to us, it ministered to us. And the body of Christ as a family is not just experienced on a Saturday morning or an afternoon for a few hours. We experience community every day and in every way. And some people call us the commuting church of God because we travel from Armadale and Parmelia and, and all over the... And we travel in from the country. And, and um, I think Carl lives the nearest. He only has three or four kilometres to travel. But the, the bottom line is we value community and to be a part of a community is the part to experience what it is to be a living sacrifice. Because whenever you're a part of a church community, you forego some of your individual autonomy and sovereignty. 
You come into community to experience Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, yet we come into the community sometimes and we experience what's called the hospital for the sick syndrome. The church is not always meant to be like that, but we're on this journey and we, we can encourage one another. Paul spends a lot of time talking about that. And today we're going to jump right in with verse 1. So while I've been referring to other scriptures, we'll stay with Romans 12 today. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So he's reaching out to them by God's mercy to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which you is your spiritual worship. What's this living sacrifice? To present all of you in Christ by God's mercy to worship God and sacrifice is a glass of water to the thirsty, using your gifts, your time, your talent and your treasure for God's glory within the context of community. And Paul is writing to the church that was in Rome. And we spend a lifetime understanding what is holy and acceptable to God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Today, seventh day, Saturday, Sabbath, was, was made holy by God. It was sanctified. It was given to man as a gift. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And we utilise the gift of this one day in a week, seventh day Sabbath, as holy to immerse ourselves as living sacrifices within the context of community. We cannot, we cannot actively engage the mandate that Christ gave us to preach the gospel without it being collective because all of us have different gifts. I look across the audience here, I see gifts of hospitality, beautiful gifts of hospitality. I see gifts of dedication to service of the children. I see a variety of different gifts. And when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan, um, the Samaritan woman by the well in Samaria, he said, you Samaritans worship on this mountain and the Jews worship in Jerusalem. The Father is seeking neither to worship in those locations, but those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And 2,000 years on from those words, the, the, the miracle of Christianity, the miracle of the work of the Holy Spirit among us to bring us into community, into fellowship. And I know in my personal experience, I can meet people that I've known for 30, 40, 50, almost 60 years in my sojourn within the Christian community. And though they fellowship at another church or another area, they're still my brothers and sisters. I love them dearly. There's a richness in our fellowship that is undergirded by the Spirit. And verse 2 begins to get a bit deeper when Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world. Jesus prays in John 17, I pray that you not take them out of the world, but you'd keep them from the evil one. They're in the world. And Jesus says, Just as you've sent me into the world, now I am sending them into the world. But the difference for you and I, we don't go off into a monastery and hide somewhere. But we're not to be conformed to this world. To be people of truth, of righteousness, of patience, of kindness. To honour God and honour God alone. And how do we do this? But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't, of ourselves, work out. I knew a man and many years ago, who said to me, I don't need religion and I don't need God because I've worked out what it is to be a good citizen, to be a decent person. And, you know, I wonder what his journey would be in another 50 years' time if I were to meet him up again in a different circumstance. You know, there's a beautiful hymn that sometimes we sing, Lord, I need thee every hour. Every hour I need you. Every moment by moment. I cannot wander from your paths. Be transformed by the renewal of the mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Brothers and sisters, what is the will of God for you? For us, collectively, according to the gifts that God has given. What is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? Now you and I struggle with that in making decisions every day and every week to speak the truth, to be about the Lord's work, 
to be compassionate, to be kind, to sacrifice our time, talent and treasure for God's glory and honour. What is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So you cannot live in community unless you're with brothers and sisters. And he says, you know, don't think of yourself more highly. And Jesus gave an example. If you're invited to a banquet, don't take the high seat. And then say, the, the banquet guests can say, oh, excuse me, sir, um, this is reserved for Mr. So-and-so. Can you go and sit down there? And, you, and you're a little bit grieved by it. What about, what about taking the lower seat, says Jesus, and then the banquet manager says, oh, oh, come and sit up here, don't sit down there. You know, Jesus says you'll always have the poor among you. So, you know, God says he can work with those who are humble and of contrite in spirit and in mind. And so Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, because the moment you do, you are not exercising servant leadership. Jesus set the example. He says, you call me Lord and teacher, and so I am. But I'm washing your feet, and I want you to have the heart of a servant. To think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What is your measure of faith? Faith of a mustard seed? Jesus said the smallest amount of faith, like a mustard seed, can move a mountain. And so faith comes into it. And knowing that we live in community and we have a humble heart, that I esteem everybody around us. You know, in the corporate world, when you're working in management... The temptation is to step on other people, not intentionally sometimes, but just the culture of, of the corporate environment to, 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 to get the good paying job. Within the body of Christ, you serve humbly, others exalt you. Others say, oh, brother, Ivan, oh, look, you know, and, and you encourage one another, you lift one another, you strengthen one another, you bless one another, you affirm the gifts that we have. For as in one body we have many members, in verse 4, the members do not have the same function. So the person next to you is gifted differently. Sometimes we may have the same inclinations. Sometimes we can recognise, oh, that person's on the same wavelength as me. But others, each of us have different gifts, different talents, different treasures, different allocations of time. But we're a part of one body. And what Paul does elsewhere in Scripture, he says not everybody's the hand or the elbow or the eye or the, or the knee, but they're all valuable. And when one part of the body suffers, everybody feels the pain. It's a reality. And as the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This is what Cain didn't understand. He said to God, am I my brother's keeper? He didn't have a right heart. He didn't care and love for his younger brother. And you and I are called to love sacrificially. Because we are individual members of one another. We make up the body of Christ. Romans 12 is not speaking to outsiders. It's speaking to those of us inside. And it's very wise words to encourage us, to strengthen us on this journey. Because if the devil can divide, subtract, and split, he will. And unfortunately, some of the history of the churches of God has been separation, going off in different directions and different denominations. And yet scripture says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body of Christ. And we also recognize, though, the visible church and the invisible church. The sign of a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, is the Holy Spirit working with us and in us. Verse 6 says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Sister Leah read scripture to us today and all of us could hang on to her words. Others serve in capacity. That's absolutely beautiful. And I'm just using that as a gift. And what is this? These are gifts that are given to us. 
And some people spend many years trying to explore what their spiritual gift is. It soon becomes apparent because others affirm you. Say, thank you so much. I really appreciate, and you have a heart for that particular ministry. And my encouragement for the church, for all of us, is to follow what God has put in your heart in the context of community in developing the gifts that you've been given. Remember Jesus had a parable where he gave different degrees of talents to different people according to the capacity? And the idea was to do something with it. Do something with it. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And I want everybody within our denomination here in Australia to feel free according to the gifts that God has given you in the context of the affirmation of community to develop them. So we have some good men who are good Bible teachers. It's come out on our Zoom Bible study. They will help us with our Emmanuel Bible classes because those men have been immersed in Scripture. And when I sit around and have a bowl of soup and a cup of coffee with them when I'm visiting, ah, oh, I come away so encouraged because all they want to talk about is the Lordship of Jesus and his word. Nothing else matters in the context of community. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, prophecy is not only prophetic, thus says the Lord, this will happen in the future. Prophecy is also forthtelling, thus says the Lord. Now if you read the New Testament, you'll see Anna, the prophetess, she was married for seven years, the rest of her life she spent in the temple as a prophetess, praying and fasting and speaking forth. Philip, the apostle, had four daughters who were prophetesses. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit poured on men and women, and your men and your maidservants shall prophesy. Now, not everybody's gift gifted with the gift of forth-telling the word of God. But what happens, you'll discover that because you read something in Scripture and you'll reach across to the near person next to you and say, oh, do you know, look at this. I've, look at what the word of God says. And this is how, the context that I understand it. And you move to tell someone and you may have a gift of forth-telling the word of God in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving... There are brothers and sisters within our body of Christ whose acts of service, both visibly and invisibly, are absolutely wonderful. And Jesus says, as you've done this to the least of these, my brethren, he says, you've done it to me. The one who teaches in his teaching. Not everybody has the gift of teaching. But those of us who do, according to the faith and the grace given to us, has a responsibility Scripture says older women teach the younger women. And that can go also like Paul teaching Timothy. Men who've been around for a long time, be a mentor. Invest yourself in somebody else's life. Teach by example. Teach by word. Teach by action. Teach through adventure and the struggle of life. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. You know, the power of language is extraordinary. You can exhort and encourage and affirm with your words. And if someone has the love language of words of affirmation, they will rejoice at your words when you encourage and inspire. Exhortation, uplifting, encouraging, inspiring in the name of Jesus is very powerful. This is what it looks like in community. The next one, the one who contributes in generosity. That's very powerful, very encouraging, because if you look at the body of Christ, you have people who are generous givers and you have people who are less generous givers. It's the nature of the dynamic that exists. But if you've been given the gift of resources and treasure and God in your heart allows you then to use that as a gift according to what God gives you, that gift of generosity is your time, is your talent. It's not only your treasure, as in the finances. All oh, that plays into it. The one who leads with zeal. You don't want a leader of women's ministry, of, of, you don't want a pastor 
who's just like a wet rag and just takes the sunshine out of your life because he's not enthusiastic. We love enthusiastic people moved by God's spirit. And we want to encourage our young men to be zealous for the Lord, zealous for his word, have a heart for his things. And when you do that in your personal life, it will reflect in your community life. Because community is only good as we are in the privacy of prayer. We can pray here and sing here and worship. But if you're doing that at home in your own time, that you lie awake 2 o'clock in the morning, reciting scripture in your mind, praying to God, that's, an, that's zeal. And anyone who leads then is zealous for the Lord, loves his people, and will live, as we said earlier, a living sacrifice. You have no zeal for your own glory. You have zeal for the one who will call your name from the grave. I love the and joy fits into that. Joy and zeal and love and living sacrifice is very powerful. And when that fits into leadership, wonderful. Anybody listening today, the Church of God Seventh Day in Australia, we need more pastors and we need more elders. And we pray for the Lord to stir our hearts up that if it's in our heart and mind, don't put it on the back burner and say, Oh, I'll think about it one day. Saying, Lord, here I am, as we sang earlier. I will go if you lead me. I don't know what to do. I'm only a small boy. I don't know my right hand from my left hand. But I will go if you lead me. I'm planning a sermon um, called David and Goliath where follow the leading of the Spirit even if it takes you into giants and moving mountains and into places that you've never been before. I will go, but only if you lead me. I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death if you are with me, my good shepherd. To lead with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This takes me to the parable of the Good Samaritan of a man travelling between Jerusalem and Jericho. Jerusalem's up high, Jericho's down in the valley. I've taken a bus on that road, very winding and barren. I can't imagine what it was like to travel by donkey. And a man gets set on and beaten and robbed. And the third passerby was a Samaritan, an outcast of Jewish society, but he had mercy and you study Jesus' parable, and I know it's a story, but I'm sure it happened. The mercy was that this man was lying on the road, beaten and looking like dead. So he bandages him. He applies medicine to him. He takes him to his inn. He looks after him. He pays the innkeeper. And then he says, look, I'm coming back later in a couple of weeks' time. Any cost that it's going to cost, I'll pay for it. What kind of mercy is that? That is a living sacrifice in verse 1. Extraordinary mercy. When someone comes to you and says, look, I'm really sorry. I, I owe you apology. You are full of mercy because you pray, Father, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who trespass against me. You are so full of mercy Justice comes into it. We'll read it again in a few minutes. But you are a merciful person. And there are some people who are more disposed to mercy. The Pharisee and the Levi, the priest and the Levi, they were serving in religious positions, but they had no mercy. Very true. We're going to look at the marks of a new, true Christian. In verse 9, Paul says, Let love be genuine. Can you think of in, un, love that's not genuine? We've all been around for a while. We, you might have thought of a relationship. You might have seen a couple wrestling in their marriage and teetering on the edge of divorce and separating where love was not genuine. Unless we're all living sacrifices, divesting ourselves of our own autonomy, willing to serve and bring our gifts in the body of Christ, love can be a sham. Remember the first century church? There was appointing of leadership and Ananias and Sapphira jumped the bandwagon. People were selling allocations of their land. It looked good publicly and they pretended to sell all their land but they kept a little bit for themselves. And Peter said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You've got a show of love and sacrifice. And so Paul is saying, let love be genuine. And he says, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Why is he stating that? Shouldn't that be 
self-evident in the body of Christ? Because we have people coming in, listening to the gospel for the very first time. Rome was a horrible, sick place societally. It ultimately, their immorality is what ultimately destroyed them. Abhor what is evil. You know what's righteous. You know what's true. Abhor it. You don't hate the person, but you hate the evil. Hold fast to what is good. And what is good? God manifest in his son. Hold fast to Jesus. Not just an idea of good, but the epitome and the personification of good. Jesus. Love one another with brotherly affection. If somebody walks in here and says, wow, you people love each other. Praise God for the kind of love that God's working with us. Outdo one another in showing honour. Instead of us blowing our trumpet and telling our story, lift one another up. Honour one another. Don't be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. You know, we live in an age of entitlement, and we were, Rebecca and I were talking about people that we've known who weren't necessarily depressed, but they were slothful. No sense of enterprise. No sense of zeal. And, 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 and Paul's saying here, don't be slothful in zeal. Don't sort of grow weary in well-doing. It's easy to grow weary in well-doing over a longer haul. Be enthusiastic. Wake up every morning and say, God, praise and glory and honour to you. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. This is very interesting. Some of us work in employment situations where we work for people in the world. And Paul knew that. Elsewhere he says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you work for masters, work as if you're serving the Lord. You reflect grace and truth and kindness and mercy. There's a scripture that says that when... Oh, if you drop down to verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. In other words, his conscience will speak to him. You are serving the Lord. And, and in doing so, you are reaching the hearts and minds of people. Jesus says... Um, let your light shine so before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is what Paul is saying. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord in the body of Christ, in your family life, in your community, with every ounce of energy that you have. Wow. Then he says in verse 12, rejoice in hope. You know that your name is written in the book of life. You know the day of resurrection is coming. You know your name will be called from the grave. You know that you have a crown of righteousness reserved for you and forever you'll be with the Lord. This is your hope. Rejoice in it. Live this. Be patient in tribulation. Ah, Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. But he says, be of good cheer. Take heart. I have overcome the world. So if our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we can rejoice in hope, but we can also be patient in tribulation. Last week and this week, I went through two different types of difficulties. It takes patience to work through hard stuff. And I said to Rebecca about the difficulty we're acknowledging in somebody's life that this is just for a season. This trouble that they're going through is just for a season. There is hope. Be constant in prayer. Don't neglect prayer. Pray every day. What is prayer? Coming to God in fellowship, acknowledging his existence. Father, holy be your name. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to hear your word. And by the way, God, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to uphold Brother Levi who's struggling with his health. I want to uphold our children, our youth, our little ones, where the world is perniciously trying to tempt them and attract them to a, another discourse. Constant in prayer. 
We have an example from Daniel in a society that forbid prayer. He could only do obeisance to Nebuchadnezzar. He faithfully went into his room and opened the window towards Jerusalem, as was his custom, and he prayed. And the titler tattlers came and dobbed him in because it was against the law. But he did it nonetheless. And the capacity to abide in prayer. When Jesus says, abide in me and I in you, just as I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. When the disciples saw Jesus praying, they said, um, can you teach us to pray? I can sense that relationship that you have. Because you say that everything that you say and all that you do is not your own. You are under authority of the Father. He does the work through you. Well, I can sense the joy of the Spirit in you, Jesus. Teach us to pray. And Paul says, be constant in prayer. Don't give up. You know, there's something beautiful about praying. Pray until the Spirit releases you in the sense of, thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for this moment of wrestling in your presence. Jacob wrestled with God all night before he got his answer. <laughs> the Lord, you may not physically wrestle, but sometimes you call out to God because a lot of people ask me for prayers overseas, because I sit on the international board, and locally across Australia, and people outside the church. And I'm committed to prayer, and I let them know through texts and messages that I'm praying for them. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Solo Christians can't do that because they don't know what the needs are among brothers and sisters in Christ and they don't have the resources and opportunity to show hospitality. Hospitality is beautiful. God is giving you a beautiful home. Is it just for you? Every time I go to Carl's place, I experience hospitality, a warmth, a hot cup of fellowship. I'm using it as an example, but I know everybody here is like that as well. I've gone to Pillar and Raquel's house and there's always been plenty to eat. I'm coming to your house one day. <laughs> Look, it's just beautiful. Show hospitality. You know, I went to Sydney without booking any accommodation some months ago and the hospitality and the grace shown me because the Lord put it in the hearts of those who have that gift. Absolutely beautiful. Precious. I, I like when I set the table is making sure there's a spare chair there. Psychologically, there's always welcome for somebody to sit at our table. And it makes you vulnerable when you invite people that are not on the same page as you to sit at the table. Always have a spare bedroom made up for the guest who might come. Now, sometimes it's advisable before you bring someone to church, let them know that you're hospitable. Come and have a barbecue at our place. Especially if they're sort of half talking about it and saying, look, can, what's this Jesus or what's this Sabbath, Saturday Sabbath? Why don't you go to church on Sunday? Like, there's a point for conversation. And it doesn't happen here. It happens outside the barbecue around the dinner table. Now, Paul is pushing the buttons a little bit further. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You think that Paul could be talking to those outside the church, and probably true. But sometimes you have tares in among the wheat. And Jesus is, and the disciples say, shall we go and pull the tares up? And Jesus says, no, because you'll uproot the wheat as well, the good crop. So sometimes you'll be accused of things that you had no, you're not complicit with. What do you do? I'm not a keyboard warrior. I will not engage in keyboard mechanisms because it's a temptation to do that is there. To respond, click, 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 click. Just tell my side of the story. Bless those who persecute you. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Pray for those who malign you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So if we are to be like that to those outside the faith, how much do we love one another? Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Some of us have the gift of empathy. You can see someone a little bit depressed and you go up with them. You can see someone who's just grieving. Rebecca and I, while we were setting up this morning, had a phone call. One of our long-term friends died overnight in Northam. I've worked with her for years. And she's gone. She died overnight. And I didn't know. I spoke with her husband on the phone yesterday prior to the event. That's like, there's a funeral to stand by some people there in the next week or two. You know, have the empathy and the care, but also rejoice. 
that zeal, that love, that gladness, that somebody has come into a good fortune, they've got a good job, they've graduated from university, they've overcome a certain difficulty, rejoice with them. Celebrate community. And if we're not living in community, we'd never understand that. It's very powerful. Live in harmony with one another. That goes without saying. But Paul is speaking to the church. Now, if we were back in Roman times, we might understand because Roman, the book of Romans, is Paul's epic work. I'm only staying in Romans 12. I, I was tempted to bring in so many other scriptures that Paul talks about in Romans. You read Romans 14, read Romans 15. The same tenor on a different level. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. He said it again. Why? Because sometimes there is the tall poppy syndrome that you think more highly of yourself. That's, what, that's the Luciferian mentality, to think more highly of yourself. I will ascend and I'll become like the Most High. I will engineer myself into places that I shouldn't be. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. That's hard for a young person, especially around the ages of 13 to 18, when you think you know more than dad and mum. And by the time you're 30, you think, wow, Dad was so wise. And for us here, you know, I've grown up in the scriptures. Ever since, I remember the first scripture I remember hearing when I was four or five going to Sunday school and then Sabbath with family from about five years on, onwards. And, you know, I came to church one day in 1995 and I said, I'm going to preempt the pastor. As I listen to his sermon, I'm going to guess what scripture he's going to turn to. Like a little bit of a know-all like a little bit haughty boy, don't be wise in your own sight. I realised since I had so much to learn. In fact, to know my saviour on a very personal level. He says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honourable in the sight of all. We all have a sense of justice. But don't take it upon ourselves to return the misfavour that you've received from somebody. You know what happens? Churches split. People leave, not because of doctrine, but because of breakup in relationships. Now, there are people who move on doctrinally. But in reality, if we're in Christ is centre and are being led by the Spirit, um, you never want to return. You bless those who curse you. But give thought to what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is beautiful. I love the part of the body of Christ that we are part of. I'm already speaking to the converted because we live this and I treasure that. But the challenge is sometimes we get comfortable in the peace and the joy and the love and somebody throws a rock our way or says a piece of misinformation and you go, oh, it's a burden you carry. In verse 19, as we begin to wrap this up, Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. In other words, if something goes wrong and you're suffering a hurt or a grievance, don't take it on yourself to solve it. Leave it to the wrath of God. If you've been around the church for many long, you realise that there have been tears. Those personalities we've come in contact with, who did not know Christ, who came and went and left a hurtful legacy. And we pray, still pray for them and say, Lord, have mercy on them. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In other words, you may, in this life, never receive justice. You may never receive justice in this life. That's okay, says the Lord. Leave it with me, says God. Don't take it in your own hands. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Brothers and sisters, that's not human nature. I know it's not high school nature. I went through a big high school. I know it's not the corporate nature in this world. But we are to speak into the hearts and minds by doing good, by speaking good, that men may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven on the day of visitation. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. We all have a conscience. And some people will think, like somebody said to me, he paid me a small sum of money yesterday. And I said, here, I'll give you an invoice. And he said, no, you shouldn't do that. Don't, don't give to the tax man. 
you keep that money and just like pocket it. The tax man doesn't need said, oh no, I'm I'm doing it for records and, and keep everything above the board. But he was quite prepared to give me a cash deal. He said, You don't have to pay too so much out of that, ten percent out of that as GST. I said, Yeah, that's right, I do, yeah. Um, he's he's by you setting a sterling example, walking in Christ, people may not agree with you, but they have to respect you. That's the burning coals on their head. Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And you and I are agents of his grace called ahead of time to reflect that glory. Finally, Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a high calling. That's why we are brothers and sisters and love one another. I mean really love one another. Don't be overcome by evil. Don't leave it, let it flatten you. Don't let it take away the joy and the zeal and the love and the willingness to serve. But overcome evil with good. What did Jesus do? I have overcome the world. He paid a great price for it. He did it the hard way. And sometimes it's hard. I'm going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks' time. But Apostle Paul speaks to us and he begins, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God. And so we have chapter 12 of Romans. Praise and glory and honour to God who brings us into community and equips and strengthens us for what this community looks like.